All right, it's Star Wars Day. Okay, technically it's not Star Wars Day. It's almost Star Wars Day, but I've done so much Star Wars physics stuff, I thought I'd put together something, a presentation. Um, so I, I'm a physics guy, and I'm, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and so maybe you are too. Maybe you enjoy this. And so it's Star Wars Day, if you, haven't, if you don't know, it's May 4th. May the 4th be with you, the Force, get it? Okay, and I'm Rhett Elaine. I put that down in the corner so you know who I am. I was going to have an image on here, but let's just get started. I picked some of my favorite uh, physics analysis of Star Wars, um, and I'm going to share them. I have so many more that it, I couldn't share them all. Okay, so let's just get started. This is from Rogue One, uh, one of the greatest space battles, really, out of all the series. It's really the best. Uh, and so in this case, uh, a hammerhead... It's called a hammerhead something. It pushes this disabled Star Destroyer into another Star Destroyer. And I think it's a, I think it's a great scene. Um, it really is. And, and so what can you analyze this? You look at, when I look at a Star Wars movie and I think, what kind of physics could I do? And I'm not trying to say it's wrong. I'm just trying to analyze it and do something with physics. And so I look at this and I, and I, I see the debris. Look at the debris coming off the ship. Okay. Would it do that? It, there's no air right but if the if it's accelerating and pieces are created and then it accelerates then it will the debris will flow away so if i look at the motion of the debris then i can get a measure of the acceleration of the of the star destroyer and the hammerhead so i can do that this is um if you're not familiar with video analysis this is tracker video analysis i'll include a link down below uh it it's a free video analysis program. You can look at each frame of a video and mark uh, sizes and locations and where the axis is and everything that you'd want to know. So in this case, I'm marking different points of the debris that's falling off of the spacecraft. And, and if I assume the frame rate's right, then I get, and I can scale the whole thing based on the size of a star destroyer, which I had to look up, right? There's, it was pretty hard to do, but I, I found, I mean, there's conflicting ideas. There's multiple kinds of Star Destroyers. So, but then I get that. I get that data. I get position versus time in each frame, and then I can get the total uh, position versus time. So I can get the velocity, the position versus time of a piece moving away from the Star Destroyer, and here's that plot. And, and it's amazing to me that, you know, this is not real. I don't know if you know that. Star Wars is not real. But it is. This has a constant acceleration. That's what you would kind of expect if this hammerhead thruster is, the hammerhead uh, spaceship is pushing the Star Destroyer away. And if you find the quadratic uh, equation that fits, the, the parabolic function that fits this data, down here you can see that. I have this y equals a t squared plus b t plus c. The term in front of the t squared is one half times acceleration because of the kinematic equations. So if I use that coefficient of 2.668 multiplied by 2, I get the acceleration. So I get an acceleration of 5.78 meters per second squared, which, you know, that's kind of fast. I mean, that's kind of, you know, think of the acceleration of a free-falling object uh, on the surface of the Earth as 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's super high. Uh, but again, you know, one of the things that you always want to think about is what would happen if it had a more realistic acceleration let's say one it would really be moving slow and it might not be as, as dramatic and the whole point of a movie is to tell a story and to make it visually entertaining so if it's not a appropriate value that's okay okay but but anyway we can actually do more than this we can model uh a hammerhead pushing a star destroyer and that's what i'm going to do and so with this i'm going to use a numerical calculation because there's actually two things that are going on with the with the thrust uh, from the hammerhead. It's not only pushing the Star Destroyer, but it's also rotating it. Okay. So this is, uh, if I break the motion into small time steps, I can calculate the thrust force, which is not constant. Okay, that the magnitude of the thrust is constant, but as the Star Destroyer turns, the hammerhead turns too. So I need this vector thrust force, and what I'm going to do is actually have that, uh, that hammerhead as a vector in hat is the direction of the hammerhead and so if i take the magnitude of the thrust multiplied by that unit vector i get the thrust vector now i can with that thrust on the star destroyer i can update the momentum and here's the trick if i break this into small time steps let's say one 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 hundredth of a second then during that time interval f is fairly constant and if f is fairly constant then uh i can assume it's constant and use that to, with the momentum principle 
to find the new momentum. So this is delta P equals uh, F times delta T. So the final momentum, P2, at the end of the time interval is the momentum at the beginning of the time interval plus that F delta T. That's the key to a numerical calculation. Uh, now the other thing, it, I need to deal with the rotation of this. So I'm actually going to take the center of mass of the star disorder, which I had to kind of approximate uh, because you don't know what the center mass of the thing is. If it was solid, you could find it. And I need a vector from the center mass to the point of contact. I don't, I don't remember why I called that RB, but I did call it RB. I need to find that, and that's going to change, right? Uh, well, it's, it's the same magnitude, but as the star destroyer rotates, that vector rotates also. Now I can calculate the torque. I need to find the torque from that same force, which depends on R cross B. And remember, both R and B change, uh, so that tells you that. And with that, again, can do something very similar to the momentum principle, which is the angular momentum principle, and I can update the angular momentum of the star destroyer. Now, if I know the moment of inertia of the star destroyer, which I will have to approximate, then I can find the change in angle during each time and use that to update where the rotation of that star destroyer in each frame and then I can model the whole thing. And then finally, I can update the position of the center mass using the momentum. This just comes straight from the definition of average velocity. Now, I'm not going to go over the code, but I did write this up as a code, and I'll include this link down below. This, I use trinket.io. It uses, uh, uh, it allows me to write uh, Python code uh, with visual animations from uh, GlowScript v Python. And so you can animate this stuff. This is not a super large program, okay? Uh, a lot of comments and stuff like that, but it's not it's not super big, and I can get something really cool, and I'm going to show you an animation of, of what I get out of this. So here is the Star Destroyer. We're looking at it from the top. The yellow arrow is the hammerhead, and then the, the, red, the red dot for the tip, just so you can see how the tip moves, uh, and then it's going to leave a trail. And, and in this case, it's not only rotating, it's accelerating. Okay, so the center mass is accelerating, and it's in 3D. Look, it's in 3D. And it's not super hard to do. And I'm not trying to sell, uh, yeah, I am, Python. Python's awesome. Okay. But let's look at another spacecraft. This is uh, the first time we see the Millennium Falcon in episode one, The Force Awakens. It was kind of a big deal. And we saw this in the trailer, and everyone's like, whoa. And you, you see these uh, TIE fighters going past it. Now, in this case, one of the things I do when I see a, the trailer for a movie, and I haven't seen the movie I get excited and I try to find out what could I figure out from this movie. And so here, could we figure out the speed of the Millennium Falcon? Uh, it's, it's not super easy, but what if I look at the motion of the TIE Fighters with respect to the Millennium Falcon? And so this depends on the idea of angular size, right? If I know the, uh, the distance to something, which I don't in this case, uh, I could find the uh, the angular size that it subtends as viewed from some camera, which is not even a real camera. So, but in this case, let's say I know the size of a TIE fighter, which I can look it up. And I can measure the angular, the parent angular size as they move closer and closer, then I can use that to calculate the position. Um, now, there, there's some tricks here, right? Because what's the angular size of the whole frame? You know, you don't know what camera it was filmed. You can either guess, or what I did was to uh, use the size of the Millennium Falcon and estimate how far away that was from the camera to get the angular field of view of the camera. Then I can measure angles on the uh, in the frame to get the angular angular size of the Tie Fighters, and then from the size of the Tie Fighters get their position. Yes, I know that's a lot of stuff, and I did all that for you. And this is what I get for the, those two Tie Fighters. There's not many frames that you can see them, but you can indeed see them, and their position is getting closer and closer to the camera with time and fairly constant rate, which, again, I'm really kind of surprised. Uh, and so then if you fit a linear function to position versus time, uh, the slope of that line would give you the, the velocity. And so here, one TIE fighter is at 383 meters per second. The other one's at 418. So let's just call it 400 meters per second. That's with respect to the Millennium Falcon. So I don't know. I mean, the Millennium Falcon could be going 100 meters per second, and the TIE Fighters could be going 300. But, you know, I've played, I played, uh, what was that game? The Millennium Falcon game. Oh, man, I forgot it. There was TIE Fighter, and then there was X-Wing, 
and then there's one where you you fly the Millennium Falcon. Well, I played that, and they're it's a probably around the same speed as the TIE Fighter. So I'm going to say they're going the same. So that'd be 200, 200. The approach speed would be 400, and that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going with the Millennium Falcon at 200 meters per second. Now we can do something cool. Here is uh, the same scene, but you'll notice it's heading down towards the ground, and it pulls up. It, it levels off. And so the question is, if it's going 200, and 200 meters per second, how many Gs is that? How many? What's the acceleration in this move? Um, so this is one of the features of tracker video analysis. When I when I mark the locations of things, I can rotate the axis, the the reference frame, and then I can say, okay, export a video with a stable axis frame, and so it rotates the video around to keep the the state the axis stable. And I just think it's kind of cool. So it kind of undid that weird rotating effect. Um, it's it's just fun. Okay, so. As you probably know, turning is accelerating. If I have a velocity going down and then later it's going horizontal, then I have a change in velocity. Even if it's the same magnitude, the change in velocity. So the, the average acceleration vector would be the change in velocity vector divided by the change in time. So if I can get these, this initial velocity vector, I know the final one's horizontal, and I can get the time from the video, I can estimate the acceleration. So here's how I did that. If you look at the Millennium Falcon in this position right here, uh, it's kind of, it's a circle, right? But it doesn't look like a circle because if you're looking at it, I'm, this, this little uh, bar here is a sideways view of the Millennium Falcon. If you're looking at it from the back, then you see this height LA that depends on the tip angle. The width is, you're seeing the whole width. Right? But imagine if it was completely horizontal, that red arrow representing the length, the, uh, the, the LA would go down to zero, right? And if it's going straight down, then you would see a perfect circle. So by looking at the, uh, the squishiness of the circle, you can estimate the angle. So it's just this length of the total spacecraft, which is this blue marker. These blue lines indicate the, the width of it. And I assume the red is the apparent version, so that's LA. And I can use that to find the angle with the sine of theta. So it's pretty easy. So here's what I get. The velocity of the Millennium Falcon is 200 meters per second. It's going down at an angle of 54 degrees, and it took 1.58 seconds. So if you do delta V using vectors, which I should have put those vectors on here, uh, divided by the time, I get 114.7 meters per second squared. That's 12.6 Gs. I mean, that's pretty legit, right? I mean, yes, they probably have some type of inertial dampers or something like that, but it's still fun to calculate it. Uh, it's a pretty high acceleration. You know, if you think about a uh, fighter you know, a fighter jet talk, pulling six Gs or something like that. That's that's pretty 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 a lot. Um, that's a lot. So twelve Gs is you know. But no one ever said these people were humans. It never does it say that uh, Ray is a human, Luke is a human. They look like humans because they're played by human actors. Now here's another case where the Millennium Falcon is flying. I love this one. This is from Empire Strikes Back. The Millennium Falcon does a loop. It's a it's a great example because it's moving in a circle. Uh, you can actually get the velocity going up, you can get the velocity going down, the change in time, and in this case you get 25 G's, but check it out. Princess Leia is just standing up in the cockpit like, hey, that's no big deal, 25 G's, I can do that. Okay, I just think that's funny. Okay, here's another one from Empire Strikes Back. Uh, this is an AT-AT falling over. Uh, so the, the question is, is this legitimate? And you know that actual, you know, one of the things I did in Empire Strikes Back is to use actual models. So this is an actual model falling over. They couldn't have done this in uh, with CGI because this is what, 1980, 1982, I can't remember. So the first question is how tall is this, how tall is this at, -AT? And you can look that up online. Or you can do what I did, which is to look at uh, Luke Skywalker goes up into the, the at, at to throw a, a bomb and then he drops down. And by looking at how long, timing how long it takes them to fall, you can calculate the height. Assuming, assuming you know the vertical acceleration, on Earth it'd be 9.8 meters per second squared. In Hoth, who knows? But everything looks like Earth, so I'm going to say it's that. And then you can model the motion of a falling object. Okay, so in this case, we would say there's a downward gravitational force. I'm going to assume all the mass is up at the top. Uh, this gives it an angular velocity, uh, and I know the length of the thing based on some angle. So how would you calculate how, how this would work? Well, let's do the same thing with a pencil. 
if I take a pencil and I hold the, the bottom stationary and let it tip over, how long does it take to tip over? Here is a pencil. I have uh, three forces on it. I have an upward normal force. I have a frictional force and then I have a, uh, the gravitational force acting at the center mass. If the tip is fixed, then I can calculate the torque about that point and the only torque is due to the gravitational force. And here you'll notice one thing. If the pencil is straight up and down, the torque would be zero and it would never tip over. Okay, so but it has to be slightly tilted and then that gravitational force will exert a torque which will make it lean over more and increase the torque. So we have a, we have a problem here that the torque depends on the sine of the angle. Torque is mgL over 2 sine theta. The torque is equal to uh, I times the angular acceleration. I did put that. Okay, I wrote it a little bit different. Um, and the moment of inertia is one-third ml squared for, for a rod. So if you put that all together, you get this differential equation, which says that the angular acceleration, the second derivative of theta, is proportional to sine of theta. So that's a pretty difficult equation to solve, so let's, not, let's just solve it numerically. So again, here's another example of a numerical calculation using the Euler method. So I want to solve this equation right here. The second derivative of theta is equal to 3g sine theta over 2l. So the first thing to do is to calculate the value, break it into small time steps, and calculate the value of the angular acceleration, which is the second derivative. So if I know the initial theta, I can calculate 3g sine theta. I, can, I know all those values. I can calculate that. With that, I can assume this angular acceleration is constant over the time interval, which is not true, but true enough. And from that, I can update the angular velocity. This is just like updating the, the momentum in the momentum principle before. So angular velocity, angular acceleration is delta omega over delta t. If I just solve for the final omega, I get omega 2 is omega 1 plus alpha delta t. And then I can update the angle with the same thing using the definition of the uh, angular velocity. Now there is something here. I put omega 2. Really that should be the average angular velocity, but I always have my students just use the final. It gives a pretty good value and it works really well and it's, it's much more simpler to implement. Okay, I want to show you a full program that would calculate this. Here is, and it, I know, forgive me for the resolution, this doesn't do the animation, but this calculates everything. Okay, so up at the top I have the length I have my constant, my initial theta. I put a very small initial theta, uh, and then I calculate in a time step and my initial angular velocity. And then you see here, I just calculate alpha for during this loop. I calculate alpha, I update the angular velocity, I update theta, I update time, that's it. And I print out the time. That tells you the time it takes to fall over. And one of the things you're gonna notice is that long, uh, you know, pencils don't take very long to fall over because if you go back here, I shouldn't go back, but uh, the angular acceleration is 1 over L, right? So it, has, so it does take longer to fall over if it's longer. Okay, so here is uh, some models for three, four different heights of ATATs, 12, 11, 13, 18. And then I also have the data from Empire Strikes Back, the dotted points. So from this, it looks like the... Uh, falling ATAT -AT is maybe at 12 meters, which it was not 12 meters. I promise you it was not that big. That's huge. Okay. Um, it is, you know, it was probably a smaller model. And what they did was they let it fall over and then they slowed down the time that it took. So they did it in slow motion and that makes it look bigger. Uh, but it's still not as big as it probably should be. It should probably take a little bit longer to fall over, but it wasn't, it's not a terrible job. Okay. But here you can see that longer things do indeed take longer, taller things, bigger things, take longer to fall over. Okay, moving along, I'm still in Empire Strikes Back. There's a ton of great stuff in here. Uh, this is Luke Skywalker, uh, and he's learning to use the Force, and he's doing a one-handed handstand with Yoda sitting on one of his feet. So this is a great center of mass problem. Uh, and a center of mass is has to do with torque. And I'm going to show you that in a second. So, But we need some assumptions. First, uh, I'm going to assume Dagobah is like the Earth, but you don't actually need that because a lot of these center mass problems, the gravitational field cancels out. Okay, And then I put a joke in there. Really, I just want to use the joke 
Dagobah is like the Earth with, but without Wi-Fi. I don't know. That was it was funny at the time. Maybe it's not funny. So then Luke is a normal human. I can estimate his height and his mass. I mean, he's based off the human called Mark Hamill. So you know, I, there's that. Uh, then the Luke Yoda system, okay, has two forces acting on it. If if I assume that he's just doing a normal one-handed handstand, and those two forces are the gravitational force pulling down and the uh, the ground pushing up. And if he's stable, then two things should happen. One, the net force should be zero, and two, the net torque should be zero. So here's how we relate uh, this idea of center mass. If I have two masses, they each have a gravitational force acting on them. If I pick some particular location, which we call the center mass, then the uh, the net torque due to the, the net force due to these two pieces uh, acts just like it's at the center mass. So I can push up at that center mass such that in this case the total torque is zero. And that's the key. That's at a location that if I push up then the total torque would be zero. So it's just like gravitational force is pulling right down there. So that's technically it's the center of gravity and the center mass are the same if the gravitational field is constant. Okay. So, but what about the center of mass of a human? This one actually was quite difficult to find. I mean, what's this? If, if you want to, well, a lot of times we say the center mass of a human is at their belly button. Uh, but what if they're not, what if they change their position? What if they pull their legs up? What if they hold their arms out? In that case, it's more complicated. So I broke a human into five pieces. Uh, arms, the torso plus the head, because that's going to be fairly constant with respect to each other. Uh, and then the legs. And so each of these pieces has a center mass. And, I, you know, what's the center mass of an arm? Where is it? And what's the mass of the center arm? Unfortunately, a lot of this data is, is from uh, cadavers. So they'll t I know it's gross. But they, they would take a, a cadaver and, you know, just look at the arm. You can find a center mass. Um, so I I'm use some data like that to get these values um, they didn't give five values. They gave more than that. So I had to kind of like combine things together and find multiple centers of mass. So, but now if I know uh, where these centers of masses are for the different positions and I move my, uh, ob my person into different positions, I can calculate uh, where those are. So these are all measured with respect to the beginning of the position. So I have the distance from the top of the arm to down is the center mass and also for the legs. And then the center mass of the, the torso is from the head. So here you go. Uh, here's a little user tip. Um, tracker video analysis is great for this, even if you're analyzing a single frame, because you can you can scale the whole thing. I put the scale of Mark Hamill right there. Uh, then I can mark the locations of each of these pieces, and then I get their X, Y positions. And Yoda, I'm just going to put his right in the middle. Uh, and and from that, I put the origin, the the point of rotation down here where his hand is, that's where the force is, right? And in order to not tip over, the center mass has to be over the contact point. So if you do this, I can calculate the center mass of my system and compare that to this, and I get it's not equal to zero. So I have the mass of the leg and all these things times their x positions divided by the total masses. And the only way for this to work is if I get Yoda to have a negative mass. So if Yoda's pulling up on his leg right here, then he wouldn't fall over. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if you look at this pink line, what's on the left? He's got a leg and a tiny, tiny, and barely his arm. And that would have to balance out all of this other stuff, which is even, which is more massive and further away. So there's no way, there's no way he could do a handstand. Oh yeah, I get it. He could use the force. I agree with that. He's using the force, okay? But I'm just trying to show you that he couldn't do it uh, without using the force. Uh, or if Yoda pulled up, and maybe Yoda's helping him cheat to give him kind of like a confidence boost. Like, hey, you can do it. You can do it, buddy. I know this is hard. You're on Dagobah, and everything's going bad, but but you did this thing, right? That's possible. Okay, so uh, I, I do have there. You can do a one-handed handstand. I can't. Actually, these are my uh, two daughters. This is an older picture too, but and it, it's actually two pictures because they did it at different times, uh, and they can only hold it for a second, but they could do it. Uh, you'll notice that they have to kind of like tilt their spine in order to get the center mass over their hand. So even then, uh, you can't hold your hand out. Uh, it's just really hard. And and there are some people that can do one-handed handstands with the weird positions, but um, it's it's tough. It's tough. 
Okay, this is another example of center mass. Here, Darth Vader lifts up rebel scum and holds him up. And so in this case, again, uh, the center mass of this rebel Darth Vader system has to be over the pivot point. So the question is, where is that pivot point? We can't see where his feet are. But if, if his depending on where that is, if the closer it is to Darth Vader, the heavier Darth Vader would have to be in order to make the center mass right over that pivot point. Uh, so if I, you can measure these distances pretty easily uh, and based on the height of Darth Vader and stuff, and I get a value, a mass of Darth Vader of 89 kilograms, which is, you know, like a normal human, up to 236 kilograms, which is, you know, like a human that has a lot of metal in them, you know, because Darth Vader. It's got a lot of fake stuff. Okay, that was just fun. Okay, this is one of the, one of my bigger uh, projects that I worked on, and that's uh, what is the uh, how fast are blasters in Star Wars? And and here we see the first star the blaster shot in all of Star Wars. Uh, this rebel uh, ship is trying to escape the star destroyer, and they're it's getting shot at and shooting back. And they're not lasers, right? We know they're not lasers because you. They were going, they'd be going too fast and you wouldn't be able to see them. There's something else, and I don't even care what they are. I think they're cool. Okay, and then this is the, I did look up the size of a blockade runner, uh, and so I'm going to need that. And so again, I can use video analysis. And there's only three frames that you can see that one blaster bolt. Uh, if, if I approximate the distance, then I can get the position of the bolt in each frame, and then from that fit a line and get the, the speed, because position over time is change in position over change in time is the slope of that line. Uh, so that's what I got. And I get, there's a large amount of uncertainty here, right? Because what, what's the size of all this stuff? It's really difficult to tell. Uh, so I actually did include uncertainty, but I get uh, 1.807 times 10 to the fifth, plus or minus 6,000 meters per second. So, so you got that. That's pretty fast, okay, with a large uncertainty. Now the net, and I, I'm going to call that a space shot, okay? Because it's in space. Does that make sense? Now here is a stormtrooper inside the Rebel blockade runner, uh, and this is the first ground shot. It's not in the ground, but it's you know people people shots. And so you can estimate this is. I don't know if you can make out that stormtrooper right there, but based on the height of the stormtrooper, I can scale the whole thing. And in this case, I again get three frames of the shot. And I get a speed here of, check that out, 15 meters per second, plus or minus 2 meters per second. So that's a lot slower. Um, but now what do you do? You go through Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and you look for every single case where you can get a blaster and estimate the speed. And I think I got most of them. There were a couple cases where uh, it was not moving uh, parallel to the, or perpendicular to the camera or you, there was no data, but I did get a lot. And so if I collect all my, my shots, I can make the following histogram. This is ground-based blasters. So, you know, things that, this includes the speeders shooting in uh, Return of the Jedi. This includes, uh, you know, someone shooting a blaster gun or something like that. And, and if you look at, uh, count up all the speeds of diff the blasters of different speeds, I get this histogram. And you can see that for the most part, most of these blasters are pretty slow. Uh, and with, but there are some that are super, super, super fast, super fast over here, over 200 meters per second. Uh, so there you go. What does that mean? Who knows? Uh, but the average speed I got was 34.9 meters per second. Just as a comparison, a normal Nerf dart is 10 meters per second. I did measure that. Um, so, you know, Nerfish dart speed, faster than a Nerf dart, but, you know, Nerfish. Okay. So, what if I include the space based stuff? Now, in that case, I actually had to uh, make a log plot. So, I took the log of the blaster speed to make this histogram because it's really difficult otherwise that the blasters in space were super, super, super fast, so you couldn't really see it. But these blue things, these purple blue uh, bars are from the uh, space-based, and you can see that they are on average much faster than the ground-based. And then I have two way over here. You see those two? They're circled. And I'll, I'll give you a second to guess what those are. Time's up. Those are the shots from the Death Star. Okay, so those are like super phenomenally fast. 
And so you may think, well, why? Uh, what if I did this? What if I remove the scale? So if I go back over here, and instead of saying, okay, I know that's uh, 0.72 meters, I instead to say this is one frame, right? That's the angular size of the video. And I go and I record the same thing. I record the data I, and I plot a histogram of ground-based and space-based shots. And so this would be an angular size per frame. Then you see I go from 0.1 angle to 0.8. I don't remember what the actual units. I think this is the width of the frame. But it's not so spread out, right? And that's because, I don't know if you knew this, but they actually just kind of like draw those blasters on each frame. And so they want them to go across the screen about the same amount of time, whether they're really far away or really close. So if you're in space and you see a blaster going, it takes about the same time to go across the screen, but that distance is much greater, so it's going to give much greater velocity. On a ground-based one, it's going to go across the screen in the same amount of time, but now you're much closer, so the distance is smaller, and it's going much, slow, much slower. Okay, now this is uh, as seen on Mythbusters. I don't know, this is a, you know, Mythbusters, first of all, I was technical consultant for Mythbusters on maybe five seasons, so, and I did do, uh, they did use my data for this episode. Um, so what they, but it was great. So what they did uh, was to take uh, a Nerf, they made a shooting tennis ball gun and they calibrated it to 58 meters per second. And that's a little bit, they do 130 meters, miles per hour, which is a little bit faster than my average. But, but the question was, they didn't want to do, you know, 35 meters per second because it might be too easy to dodge. They want, they want to do it in that range of, you know, they want the miss to be interesting, right? You don't want to have something that's just, oh, well, everyone knows that that's not true or that's impossible. They want it in that middle place where it's fun to test. Because, you know, Mythbusters is all about having fun. Look at all the stuff they built. And they Look at this look at this uh, studio they built for this, this shot. That's amazing. And Adam got all dressed up as Han Solo. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, but they did the same idea and they used my data and uh, there you go. And so then here's Adam trying to uh, dodge a blaster. The question was, can you dodge a blaster? And the answer was no. They said no. Okay. It depends on how close you are, though. And so that's just pretty funny. Okay. What about Jedi jumps? This is another case where I looked at a whole bunch of data to try to get as much stuff as I could. And so I went through... Uh, episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. I didn't do 9 because I did this before 9 came out. And I want to look at every time a Jedi jumps, what can I see about how they jump? So the first thing is, when do they jump? Right. So if you count the number of times a Jedi jumps, and I will go ahead and admit, I did count Jar Jar's jump into the water in Episode 1. I mean, he could be a Jedi, right? And, and also any Sith jumps. And, you know, maybe maybe he's a Sith. Uh, so you see here that in Episodes 1, 2, and 3, there's a lot of jumping going on. Okay. And there was no jumps in Episode 4. There's, like, 1 or 2, and I can't remember the number, 2 and 5 and 2 and 6. Uh, and then there was no jumps in 7, and there was no jumps in 8. Okay. I think there are some jumps in 9, but again, I didn't do that. So what data could you get from a jump? Well... There's a whole bunch of different kind of jumps, right? I could start from the high ground and end at the low ground or opposite, right? So, so I have to look at the starting position, the, the highest position, and the final position. And then I can look at the time it takes to get to the highest position, the time it takes to the lowest position. And so if I do this, sometimes I can't see, like, where they land or when they land. I only have part of it. But as long as I have either uh, T1 and Y2 minus Y1 or T2 and Y2 minus Y3, then I can look at half a jump and that's what i'm really doing when i talk about the height it's it it's the difference either going up or down it doesn't really matter uh i didn't look at the the full jumps because there's so many that don't have full jumps and this includes like jumping off of a ledge uh that would be just y2 to y3 right so and this guy i did the green lightsaber in there for you okay so if you do that uh i can look at the height and the and the times and so just as a histogram just for fun uh how many, what, what, how high did they jump? Uh, and you can see that there, most of them were in this uh, 4.6 meter range. That was my average. But there are some, they're super, super high. I know one of those is 
Mace Windu in Episode 2 when he jumps off uh, down to fight the droids. And then he fights Jango Fett. Uh, and this other one, maybe that's like um, Obi-Wan jumping off of... Um, maybe it's Obi-Wan jumping off in uh, Episode 2 also. I can't remember. Uh, and then the hang time... Then we can look at the hang time too, and then we get a hang average hang time of 1.267, 1.26 seconds, uh, and you know just just to, to see where we're at. But here's what I really want to do. What if you look? What do you calculate the vertical acceleration? If I wanted to find the vertical acceleration using the kinematic equation, I could say the acceleration is twice the change in height divided by the time squared, and and that means that if I plot twice the change in height versus the hang time squared, then if they're all the same acceleration, then I should get a straight line. So this is a plot of all of the people that jumped, and you can see, I do have Jar Jar there, he, he's green, but Yoda's green too, so I think, I think this data point over here that has a very large time squared, uh, that's Jar Jar, and these other small ones are, are Yoda. Um, so this red line, is the acceleration of Earth. If they jump and they have a free fall acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared, then it should be this red line. So that's what you would expect. If it was real people on Earth, then they'd all be up here. But sometimes these have a smaller acceleration, right? So they, they, have, a, they have a greater hang time than what they'd expect. And then these have a lower hang time than what you'd expect. Now, I'll tell you, the coolest thing is this. If you look at Yoda, look at all Yoda's jumps. They are all super high acceleration. And that's because Yoda jumped a lot when he fought, fought Count Dooku. And he was jumping all over the place. And when the thing was that if, if he wanted to jump up and get back down before he, so he could jump again quickly, he had to accelerate down and get down back down to the ground. So he actually had an acceleration greater than gravity in order to jump up and come back down. I wanted to model that. I haven't gotten around to modeling that, but I want to build a model of that in Python just for fun. Uh, maybe that's on my list. Uh, so there's all your Jedi jumps, not including uh, Episode Nine, uh, not including the Mandalorian, because you know there's some Jedi's there. Uh, not including Clone Wars, all the Clone Wars cartoons, because that's a lot of jumps. Uh, but I should do that at one point. Okay, so I'm going to end there. I'm going to I'm going to leave you uh, with this. These are two uh, rate my Jedi masters I made. I made one for Yoda, and I made one for Luke Skywalker in uh, episode. Which one was it? I can't remember. But you know, I think it's kind of funny. I did give them both the chili pepper because someone's going to think Yoda's hot, right? And that just makes sense. Um, and the number of ratings, I don't remember why I gave him that, three, five, well, I thought it was funny. Okay, so there's some stuff. I'm going to include some links down below. I'm going to include a link to my uh, page that lists all of my Star Wars analysis. There's a whole bunch. Uh, it's, this is before May the 4th. I have a new one coming out this May the 4th, uh, Star Wars Day, so you can check that out. And I hope that you do your own analysis. If you do, or if you have any questions, I'm here. Just ask me. Post a comment down below. May the force be with you.